audio. Joining with the audio. Okay, good evening, boys and girls. Welcome to the party. I'm glad you can join me. I understand we're having a lot of load shedding. I'm fortunately not. So it looks like a fairly small class, but um, I've had about 10 people tell me they can't join tonight. But that's cool. We will take it as we go. So tonight is um, about one group of animals and only one group of animals only. Hippopotamuses or hippopotami, depending on how you use the, the collective noun or the plural, I suppose. So, um, yeah, I've had a bit of a hectic relocation moving up here. So um, I had to snap this class together today. So it might not be up to scratch. I do apologize. Um, I didn't make it. I made it yesterday and then the power went down and I forgot to save. So I lost my entire bit of um, class material that I prepared. So everything was done in the last four, um, well, in about four hours today. So <laughs> we'll see how we go. Okay, cool. Okay. So sharing screen and away we go. Cool. So going back to Sertia Artactyla, to the Whipper Morpha. I love that name. As always, is a book of the week. This week is uh, Game Ranch Management. Um, even if you don't do game ranch management, if you're not a game ranger and you're not doing breeding of, of animals, it's a great book to have because it gives you deep insight into the trials and tribulations and challenges of actually running a reserve and actually understanding what goes into keeping these animals functioning. Because remember, we don't have natural ecosystems anymore where animals can go wherever they want. We've got everything in fences, specifically in Southern Africa. East Africa is a lot more flexible, but uh, Southern Africa, everything's in a cage, effectively. So yeah. Um, get the book and read it. It's uh, about that thick. I think about a thousand pages, but uh, you don't have to read it in one go. Um, big textbook. Okay, so we're talking about the hippopotamus, literally meaning the water horse. Hippo being horse and potamus meaning water. The water horse or the river horse. Interestingly, the Chinese name He Ma literally means water horse as well. So there we go. Cool. So understanding hippos. Hippopotamuses or hippos are an iconic African species. Uh, however, until fairly recently, I mean, when I say fairly recently, I mean fairly recently, they occurred across much of the old world. Currently, there are only two living species, um, and the African hi hippo, which is the most well known, was historically found across the entirety of sub Saharan Africa. Um, so, Whippermorph is broken into the two groups. The hippopotamuses, the hippopotamidae, which are the hippos, and the cetaceans, which are whales and dolphins. And while they're different, uh, quite distantly related, very distantly related, they are the most closely related of all the artiodactylans, and they share numerous similar features. And we won't get into all those features today, we're just going to touch on them. So, they both have a common ancestor around 54 million years ago. That's only about... Um, 11 million years after the dinosaurs went extinct. So the previous range of hippos, as you can see the whole way through the Nile Delta, all along the Nile and everywhere south of the Sahara, that's where hippos could be found except for the Namib Desert. And present distribution is quite limited. Uh, they've been blasted out pretty much everywhere of South Africa. Healthy populations still occur in, in, in Mozambique, uh, Kenya and Uganda and a few other places are still got healthy populations. But most of their native habitat, they've been completely extirpated from, unfortunately, because people are people. The pygmy hippo, by contrast, um, much, much, much smaller and is limited just to the curve of West Africa over here. And even there, their native ranges have been obliterated. So there's very few left actually in the wild. In fact, I think they are more in captivity than they are in the wild today. So. Hippos and whales deviated from other octodactylans around 54 million years ago. And the ancestor of all these species are a group of animals, one of which we don't know how, um, we don't know all the species, but one of these species was Pachycetus, which was an ancient artiodactyl that occurred roughly for 54 to 48 million years ago through what is now Pakistan. Remember, the world looked very different back then. The, the geology and the geomorphology was drastically different today. So India and Pakistan and Africa didn't exist in, as we currently know them, but the region that was previously, what is today Pakistan, was 
the, um, the home grounds of Pachycetus. And this is a skeleton over here. Very crocodilian in appearance, actually, surprising, just coincidentally. And he had a few features. Um, obviously, we don't know what habitat he occurred in. We can only assume, uh, we can only surmise what he came from because looking at a skeleton and his physiology, and we say, what would he have lived in? Like we can look at a seal and we can guess that he lives in the ocean. You heard he would live in the Sahara Desert. So their limbs were solid bone, much like other aquatic mammals. Um, and that is a key feature to an aquatic lifestyle or to at very least a swamp-like lifestyle. And also this long point of face, which would have given a predatorial lifestyle. So he was more than likely, it would make no sense for a land-based animal to have solid bones in his limbs. Uh, they would weigh him down and would make his life very difficult. So in all logical sense, he had to be a semi-aquatic or aquatic animal. Uh, and having a lot elongated face, he was probably a predatory animal, especially with those teeth. And um, they would have made them uh, capable of standing fully submerged in water. And gradually, these uh, species evolved into two groups, the whales and the hippos. We're not going to talk about the whales today. We will do them next week. And around 30 to 40 million years ago, uh, anthracotheriums, which were more hippo-like began to appear throughout Eurasia. So they started diversifying and spreading into areas. So there was a large group of anthracotheriums, but um, we just refer to them as the anthracotheriums. And this is what they looked like. Fairly pig-like in appearance, actually. Um, but they were the ancestors of hippos. What you'll see with these guys over here is that they still walked on two toes and their uh, dew claws were actually still suspended off the ground. And as these guys grew in size, they actually had to rest more and more weight on their body, on their feet. So they actually re-evolved the ability to actually stand on four tones as opposed to two toes. And what you can see over here is those modified uh, dentition as well. Those canines and those incisors, the molars, the elongated face, the heavy, hard, robust jaw, and that rather robust build all round. Around 20 million years ago, modern hippos, when I say modern hippos, I'm talking about the hippo we know today, hippo uh, amphibious, I'm talking about hippos that would be related to modern hippos, began to fear, appear in the fossil record. The oldest truly modern hippo species that we know of, uh, which is just from a few fragment fossils, is Kenyapotus, which dates back about 16 million years ago. And the current African species as we know it today, the African hippo, not the pygmy hippo, is divided into four to five subspecies. And this is based on their head shape, okay? So they actually vary quite drastically from region to region. And it's either four or five, depending on what scientists you ask. The um, pygmy hippo is, is broken down into two subspecies by contrast. Now hippos obviously, we know what a hippo looks like, but what makes a hippo? Um, they're characterized by a highly dense bone structure, highly modified canines and incisors, a thick layer of fat, extremely thick skin. Ours is only a few millimeters thick. There's a six centimeters thick. They have rather aggressive oily secretions covering their body and significant sexual dimorphism between the males and females. Males about three and a half tons and a female is about 1500 kilograms. So uh, it's, there's a big difference. So I'm sure you've all seen hippos that are pink, but hippos actually aren't pink, they're light gray to dark gray in color. And this is due to the fact that they actually sweat a substance called hipposudoric acid and nor hipposudoric acid. And initially this is a bloody viscous clear liquid, it almost looks like, like watery blood. And this goes back to the, obviously stemmed the rumor that uh, hippos sweat blood, they don't sweat blood. So the hippo, they sweat this hipposudoric acid. And Within a few minutes of being exposed to air, this acid actually turns bright pink in color. Now, it's acid, as in, it's not stomach acid, it's not pool acid, it's not going to melt your skin, but things are either acidic or alkaline in property, and these are acidic in properties. And what's amazing about this is that it's both antibiotic and has some, uh, some bar properties in it. And the antibiotic properties are obviously very important because hippos are extremely confrontational, extremely violent, especially the males, and they tear each other to pieces. So they need to have oily secretions on their skin that actually protects them from infections, especially since they're lying in filthy, filthy um, algal ridden and bacteria ridden water. So you can see over there on the belly, on the sides, around the mouth, around the ears, and even this slight pinkish sheen to the hippos. And you can see again, 
uh, these just really miserable scars. The older males being far better off than the females and the young calves. Although the young calves have got quite a few nasty scratches as well. I mean, that's pretty awful over there if you see what I'm seeing. So, and again, that's the reason why they have this incredibly thick skin. I mean, they literally, it's body armor. Protect, as much as it's protecting them from the, the water, uh, from heat loss from water, it's also protecting them from punctures and stabs, from tearing each other to pieces. So they're pretty much built for war. They're really a violent creature. A hippo milk is also pink for the exact same reason that their uh, skin is pink. They actually, ex um, remember we talked about uh, mammary glands being highly modified, um, exocrine glands, which is effectively highly modified sweat glands. And the same chemical compounds come out of the, the mammary gland so that um, what do you call it? Sorry, the hypocidoric acid actually comes out of the mammary glands as well and actually turns the milk pink. Don't think it tastes like strawberry though. Apparently it tastes nice, but uh, who am I to judge? Okay, so this is a modern hippo jaw over here. And what you can see is they've got this really extended jawbone over here and that's purely for muscle strength. They want that so they have that biting power. Okay, so then when they bite, it's just a shotgun blast of raw energy. And that's all it is. There's this huge anchor point on the jaw over there. So they have this massive wraparound of muscle and they can just bite through anything if they want to. Okay, they don't actually use it for browsing though, or for grazing. And again, you can see they stand on four toes because they are, highly, they are extremely heavy and their body is really, really, really robust. Shortened tail, um, their whole system is basically just built to, to, to hold their weight. And that's the jaw over there. And what you'll see over here, the two canines actually shave against each other, very similarly in many ways to almost what a rodent does, because these continue to grow throughout the life, as well as uh, the incisors stick outwards, which makes no sense. People would say, well, what, the, what is the point of having teeth that stick outwards? Because teeth are for eating. Um, and you'll see over here that really robust zygomatic arch, that long uh, buccal snout over there. Um, and again, just that really, really robust jawline. Okay. And the teeth are not really designed or built for, for, for grinding. They're more just for chopping and cr cropping. Most of their digesting goes internally. They're not really grinding anything up. So they don't have flat molars. So hippo teeth, with the exception of molars, have very little role in food consumption. The canines constantly grow throughout their lives and actually sharpen against each other, as you can see. So they literally are shearing. These two, the upper and bottom canines, literally just shear each other and create these two blades. I mean, that's the only way you could use for them. They're far sharper than an elephant tusk. And whereas an elephant tusk is a Swiss army knife, it's a tool for many uses. Those, those hippos canines are purely for tearing and for killing. That's all they're there for. They don't have any other function. They are weapons. Tusks, like elephant tusks and rhinos, uh, rhino horn is also just purely a weapon, but the elephant tusk is a tool and a weapon, so it can afford to be a bit blunter. And the incisors jut outwards because they're basically daggers. They're to rend and to claw. They are just weapons. So they stick outwards like little blades and they just shear and tear and make life miserable for anyone engaging them. So they're both purely used for self-defense and for conflict. And they actually use their lips, their upper and lower lips, to crop grass. So they, they've got these hardened, very leather-like lips, and they crop grass with this. So that's how they eat. They don't use their teeth beyond just chewing up their grass and swallowing it. And their skin, as I said, is about 66 centimeters thick, so it protects them from competition, other males that are going to war with them. Okay, so you can see over there, this poor bug over here, he's had a, a lifetime. I took a this photo up in Pongola Game Reserve, and he's just had a really 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 miserable life i mean he's obviously an old brute uh, his one tooth is much uh, shorter than the other you can actually see him eating over there so i don't know he's obviously got some reeds or some grass and again he only used that lip and his bottom lip to actually crop the grass pull it out and then he would chew it with his teeth and unlike other ruminants he can't really chew from side to side he can only chew up and down so it more acts like um, scissors effectively cropping up their grass so they eat a surprisingly small amount of food for their size, only around 2% of their body weight uh, per day. And remember we talked about um, the, the, the um, body weight to, to metabolism uh, ratio. And the bigger you are, the slower your metabolism simply because you're holding onto their energy. And hippos also, by virtue of the fact having a lot of fat covering their body, they actually insulate very well and they have a very slow metabolism because of this. 
And they will spend their days in water doing not much beyond um, mating and grunting and make life difficult. They actually come out of uh, water at night to graze and they will try and travel long distances. Hippos have been discovered up to 20 kilometers away from a water source. So they make, they make tracks at night. And um, that's one of the dangers of walking in the bush anywhere near an area with hippos. You'll find them in the middle of nowhere sometimes. And um, they're actually important dredges for waterways and they break up detritus and they facilitate the flow of water. So a lot of wet, wetlands actually require hippos to break up this, uh, the, the, the detritus in, the in their um, wetland areas and just break them up and create these little tributaries and streams through them. So you actually get fresh water coming into the area. Otherwise the water stagnates it becomes eutrophic and there's no oxygen in the area. So the entire water source dies. So they act like basically almost a, a, a reoxygenating agent by allowing water to flow into the area. And um, we often talk about the negatives of soil erosion, but we also need to consider the positives of soil erosion. They contribute to bank erosion and this helps widen rivers. And if you know about um, geology, rivers cut down to ruts over time and eventually they get river, gets river, uh, gets deeper and deeper and deeper and the slope becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, hippos are virtue of just simply moving up and down the bank all the time with their weight every night. They actually break down the banks of the river and actually cause the river, river to widen, slowing down erosion of the river itself, the way it cuts into the, into the bank and also just creating wider, more accessible, slower flowing rivers rather than these rampaging torrents, which can do a lot of damage. So in areas that they've actually discovered hippos going extinct, uh, regionally extinct, there's been a significant amount of flooding, specifically in Mozambique, which historically used to have these wonderful wide rivers. And now they've got these sharp angular rivers and they just create floods. You know, they tear down through the, through the landscape and they just create ca chaos. So hippos are important. And while few predators are actually actively able to prey on hippos, they try their luck, but they usually fail. Uh, they're going to punch through six centimeters of, of uh, skin before they even get to anything important. Um, hi dead hippos are a major food source for many waterman scavengers. Fish, crocodiles, um, a lot of um, cats that hang out in banks of rivers, um, you know, and whatever it eats, whatever it can get their hands on the carcass. So they provide a lot of nutrition for, for, for a lot of scavengers. And um, even the mongooses have been observed, water mongooses have been observed scavenging of hipp hippo carcasses. So guys, if you can just put the microphone to mute. I'm going to use Okay, there we go. Um, their high aggression level also acts as a deterrent for other megafauna, allowing them access to water for us for smaller animals. So they deter rhinos, they deter elephants because they're so hyper aggressive. Especially eddies love to bathe in water and um, they just make life unpleasant for other animals. And hippos are very confrontational. And elephants often just keep distance away from water sources in many areas with lots of hippos. And that just allows smaller animals to get access to water and not have all those water sources drunk and drunken up by elephants. So male hippos are extremely territorial, especially in times of drought where the, the, the rivers become ponds or the small lakes. And they'll actively kill each other to protect their territories. And males can keep harems from anything from five to 50 even recorded up to 150 females in the Masai Mara, but typically not more than 50. 150 is like atypical size. And mating typically occurs in the, in the water simply because of the difference in size between the males and females. The male's three times the weight of the female. She can't carry his weight. So um, that's why they mate in the water. And gestation is about eight to nine months. And um, the, the female will usually have a calf every two to three years. So females in the ostrich, they will actually urinate in the water and indicate their readiness. They, they stand in the water, they just pee all over themselves and they just wafts through the stream. So the males actually pull the water, that's, they're constantly, whenever they detect, detect a female urinating, they'll pull the water into a vomeral nasal gland, like a syringe. And a vomeral nasal gland are these glands that they actually have in their mouths for protecting pheromones. So once the male is aware that she's ready to mate, she will mount her and they'll do their business. It's not very romantic. And immature or submissive males will also actually urinate in the, in the territory of dominant males to indicate their stance as non-dominant non or non-aggressive males. So they'll say, listen, buddy, I don't want to fight with you. You're the chief and I'm literally pissing myself. So today over there, you can actually see the vomeral nasal glands and they act like little syringes. And all mammals and most reptiles actually have this. 
um, with reptiles, we call them Jacobson organs. Over there. So they have like little syringes, they suck in the water and the male can actually detect the urine in the water and see the females in estrus and off he goes and does his business. So the vomeral nasal gland is a specialized organ used for detecting pheromone signals found in mammals and other reptiles. And mammals perform a phlegmon response, which is a grimace. Okay, they're not actually growling, they make the face to detect when the female is ovulating. What that does is it actually dries up the palate and allows them to detect pheromones far better. Primates don't have that. We're primates, so we don't have one. Although we still do have indentitions, we don't have fully functioning vomeral nasal glands anymore. We do have redundant ones or rudimentary ones inside our nasal cavity as dual primates, but they no longer function. They're just kind of there. So us chimpanzees, gorillas, but most other mammals do have them. Okay, so you can see on your dog over there, he's also got two vomeral nasal glands entry holes over there, but for contrast. There was, these are the best ones I can get, but you can find, I've got a cat skull, same thing. You'll find it on a seal skull, you'll find it on elephant skulls, you'll find it on countless mammals, you'll find this, and on your reptiles as well. Those two little glands at the palate. Okay, and you can see over here, this is the Fleming grimace. These animals all are scenting the air and actually picking up, so they're not making funny faces, they're not growling, they're not angry, they're actually making a detection of the vulnerable, uh, of the pheromone scent. And there's a hypothesis that smiling and signs of aggression between males and female primates also evolved from this, but we'll get into that in another, level, uh, in another lecture about primates. So, hip bones, unlike other mammal bones, which are porous with a marrow center, uh, the leg bones of hippos are solid the whole way through. They're what we call osteoclerotic, and that means they're literally solid bone. There's no porous structure to them, and there's no marrow. They are just rock. They're really, really heavy. And this adds, adds weight to the hippo that anchors them into the water. So contrary to popular belief, hippos are not great swimmers, and they typically don't go deeper than they can stand. And swimming is limited to short periods, basically just to get from A to B very quickly. But um, they like to just stand in the water and be happy. And if they're ever actually going underneath the water, they're actually just literally just getting onto their knees. Uh, they're not stopping to swim. Because when you see them sitting in the water like that, they're not swimming. They're not doing doggy paddle. They're literally standing in the water. And then they get on their knees to hide themselves. So these are human, as you can see over here, and birds. I showed you this before. Uh, birds have got these air pockets. Mammals, uh, most mammals, including humans, have got marrow. Uh, hippos are completely solid the whole way through. Pretty cool stuff. Extremely heavy, extremely dense. So, um, hippos have a three chamber stomach. We call them pseudo ruminants. Remember, like a giraffe, I mean, sorry, um, not a giraffe, a um, camel. We discussed it last time. So, they have a three chamber stomach. So we call them pseudo ruminants. So, the peritial blind sac, which is in the front, it enters the esophagus, goes into the PB sac over here, the peritial blind sac. This assists with microbial fermentation. It passes through the sac in the middle and then finally through the glandular stomach like we have, which is um, just acids and it breaks it down. Then it enters into the digestive tract. So they actually have a very inefficient digestive system. Um, nowhere near as advanced as a ruminant system. So they don't chew the cud like other uh, ruminants do. They just simply have a three-chambered stomach. Okay, and then the pygmy hippo, which is... Um, Quite cute, actually. Uh, doesn't look intimidating at all. Now, pygmy hippos are quite different to African hippos. They are mixed feeders. They eat a range of fruit, herbs, and leaves. Hippos almost exclusively eat grass to greater or lesser extents, depending on the individual. Um, but pygmy hippos are mixed feeders. They take whatever they can get regarding vegetation. And they regularly mate and give birth on the land, whereas normal African hippos, the common hippo, does this in water. And again, they're also more active during the day, but also at night. But hippos stay in the water exclusively during the day, unless it's rainy or super cloudy. Pygmy hippos are out day or night, it seems to be the case. And their dentition is far less pronounced. They don't have these massive, robust jaws and hyper-aggressive canines. And again, unlike hippos, they're often solitary or in small groups, maybe four to five. You might find one male with two to three females, maybe four females, but certainly not 50 to 150 like you would get with the African hippo. And again, here's the skull over here. See that really robust jawline over here? Um, but those really quite petite, <laughs> you can call them petite. 
uh, canines and is really insignificant in sizes over there. Just nothing to write home about. And the exogamatic arch over there also shows that he doesn't really need a robust build around his face because he's not as confrontational as that bird. And he doesn't get in as many conflicts. So he doesn't really need to have that hammerhead uh, skull. And there's a little fellow underwater over there. As you can see, walking underwater. We would have a hard time doing that. He's anchored to the ground. So we're going to talk about some extinct species of hippo. Yes, lots of species of hippo are extinct. The European hippo, Hippopotamus antiquus, ranged throughout Europe from Italy through to the British Isles. He went extinct around 10,000 years ago. And uh, it will take a thousand years. And they were bigger than the African hippos. Um, so again, male hippos um, were ray. African hippos range from 2.5 to 3.5, but based on the average skeletal structure of these guys, they weighed on average about 3,200 kilograms. So they were widespread well throughout, from Italy, Spain, France, all the way to Europe um, during the time of ancient humans and just gradually with human expansion and also with the end of the Ice Age, they were outcompeted by humans and driven into extinction, unfortunately. Uh, the giant European hippopotamus, he went extinct about 100,000 years ago. So probably not too much to do with us and just competition with smaller species. And they weighed around 4,000 4, kilograms and they were limited. Well, actually, they were, had a far greater distribution. Their fossils have been uh, found and, um, from the British Isles all the way through to Eastern Europe. So right through across to Poland, their fossils have been found. And when I say fossils, I'm not talking about fully converted fossils. I'm talking about even when they're still calcium carbonate, they're still effectively skeletons in the ground because 100,000 years ago is not that long ago. And there were actually a numerous, there were numerous uh, populations of island hippos in the Mediterranean. And each Mediterranean island actually had its own species of dwarf hippos, much like the West African dwarf hippo. And most of them went extinct during the last ice age as human trials be uh, began to colonize previously unreachable areas. Pygmy hippos are tiny, they're at 250 kilograms, super easy to hunt, and they hang out in the water all day, they're easy to hunt down. So only when humans colonized these islands, remember we talked about pigs being brought up, uh, onto the Isles of Cyprus around 9,000 years ago, and this was at the exact same time that these uh, hippo species went extinct. So the one species was the Cyprus dwarf hippopotamus, it went extinct around 9,000 years ago, small little guy, he only was about 70, uh, 75 centimeters tall, so not even waist high, and only weighed probably around 200 kilograms. And we talked about why they're so small, and this was due to island dwarfism. We've, we've talked about island giganticism and island dwarfism before. It's also called insular dwarfism because they're on an island. Another species was the Malta dwarf hippopotamus, also extinct around nine to 10,000 years ago. Um, and again, there were lots of other species, Crete, Sicily, even mainland Saudi Arabia, they had species of hippos hanging out near water sources. But they went, uh, the Arabian hippo went extinct, I think about 200,000 years ago. Crete and Sicily hippos all at the same time, around 9,000 years ago, when humans land on those islands, within a couple hundred years, completely annihilated all the native hippo populations. There were also elephant populations and leopard populations and lion populations on those islands as well. So how did they get there? Um, this was due to the Mesonian salinity crisis, uh, which occurred around 6 million years ago. So what we're looking at the Mediterranean Ocean over here, and this is actually when the Mediterranean Ocean's water levels dropped significantly around 6 million years ago, allowing animals to migrate freely between Africa and Europe and allowing animals to colonize previously unreachable areas. So, it was attributed to a combination of tectonic and glacial movements. And the majority of the water in the Mediterranean actually drained out. It was able to evaporate it. There was no water coming in due to glaciers. So gradually over time, it actually evaporated and created this incredibly saline soil. So there were very few plant species actually growing at the bottom of the Mediterranean. And it was actually three to five kilometers below modern sea levels, if you can believe that. But um, they found, um, they found animal bones, animal fossils um, underneath the Mediterranean at the bottom of the shore. They've done excavations. They've found the deposits of, of uh, salt. So we know that evaporation happened. And we found plants also having grown in those areas. We found the fossils having grown in those areas around 6 million years ago. So we know it happened. And again, that's how hippos, elephants, lions, 
their own species actually got to these islands because they couldn't swim across to the, I mean, Crete's pretty far from mainland Greece. And um, it actually ended around 5.3 million years ago with the Zanclean floods. Uh, more tectonic action and glaciers disappeared through global warming events and the Mediterranean just flooded in again and actually filled up the oceans. So the resulting draining and evaporation actually left significant uh, deposits of salts in the soil, altering the soil chemistry. And even today, the Mediterranean Ocean is significantly higher in its salinity than the neighboring Atlantic Ocean. There is some balancing going out, but it's still a massive contrast in salinity. So let's talk about Madagascan dwarf hippos. Yes, more hippos have gone extinct. So Madagascar was home to several species of hippos until about a thousand years ago. And remember, this was the time that Vikings were running around Europe and, um, you know, Charlemagne was uh, fighting off the, the, the Moorish tribes in Europe and um, the, the Mongolians were rampaging across East Africa. So this was not that long ago and this was just the other day. Um, so there are extremely high numbers of fossils and bone collections of a variety of species of dwarf hippos on Madagascar. And they're actually more closely related to the dwarf hippos than to true hippos. So they are, there's some contention of which genus they actually belong to. And Malagasy hippos de, uh, numbers declined significantly from the moment humans arrived on the island. The moment they appeared, poof, they disappeared. So this was an actual, not even fossils, these are bones discovered of the Malagasy hippopotamus. Okay, they're still fully, fully developed bones, not fossilized, calcium carbonate, as you know, you really couldn't tell the difference. So, Recent uh, skeletal discoveries indicate that these species have thrived until, seven, uh, until about a thousand years ago. But even more recently, we found pockets of skeletons which indicate they may have been around until even 200 years ago. This was the time of Napoleon. So, and in 1976, villagers in the area reported that they saw large gray animals near a town called Bellissimur. Um, that actually came through the village, the villagers ran away, and from the descriptions of the villagers, there may have been pygmy hippopotamuses. Uh, biologists went into the area, they couldn't find them, unfortunately, and they're probably being hunted to extinction if they were surviving. Um, no surviving populations to date that we know of have been found, but there may be somewhere isolated in Madagascar a surviving population of Malagasy hippopotamuses. Hippopotami. So, humans in Madagascar. So let's talk about humans in Madagascar because it's an area that people don't know a lot about. So the first people to arrive in Madagascar were actually the Malaysian, Malay tribes, and they first settled on the island around 300 BC to 580. They were tribal people, effectively Stone Age, very low in numbers. Around 400 years later, Malaysian traders and settlers uh, quickly landed on the island, actually cleared large tracts of land. Uh, making, it uh, making it habitable for humans and developing farming lands, rice paddies, and villages. Arabian settlers um, settled in, the, in the, the Malaysian colonies by about 700 AD to 900 AD. And by about 1000 AD, they started bringing across the Arabian, the Arab uh, traders, brought across Bantu slaves, black slaves, and workers uh, to be imported to Madagascar. And they kept them with the Malaysian slaves that they kept. And these people obviously interbred over time. Around 1100 AD, Tamil merchants settled in the towns, uh, gradually again, mixing up the diversity of the people sitting in Madagascar, and various kingdoms evolved and developed over this time for about 400 years. And they were a combination of Indian, Black, and Malaysian people. So really a hodgepodge mix of cultures. And the, the Bantu and Malay peoples began to intermix and produce what we know today as the Malagasy people. They're more limited to the eastern half of the country, but there are some on the western half. The people on the western half tend to be pure Bantu or African people, though. And there's a strong influence of, of Asian culture, especially in their vocabulary. If you go to speak Tagalog in the Philippines and you hear some of the Malagasy words, you'll even hear some of the similar words in their languages. Around 1500 AD, the Portuguese settlers landed on the islands, establishing resupply laters, and the French arrived in the 1700s. So this nonsense about Europeans being colonists, please, we, we got there like 400, 500 years off everywhere else. Arab traders colonized a uh, Africa about a thousand years before the Europeans did. So I, I, you know, politics aside, Europeans, they were not the first colonists of Africa. Okay. So hippos are, are host to numerous parasites. And besides oxpeckers, barbels, which are nature's oxpeckers or water's oxpeckers, are well known for cleaning ticks um, and submerged underwater, barbels being catfish. 
and they're also sub, uh, infested with a variety of worm species, one of which is ocular tremor hippopotamii, and it's a species of monogean flatworm, which is specifically adapted to living in the eyes of hippos, only hippos, kind of cool. So this is him over here, that's a hippo's eye, and he's living attached to the eyeball. Pretty gross stuff. Ocular tremor hippopotamia, hippopotami. Now, hippos are also an invasive species, believe it or not. In the 1980s, Pablo Escobar, a Colombian cocaine kingpin, they even made a TV show about him, imported four hippos into his hometown. And since his death, the population has grown to around 80 individuals. And they're considered an inv invasive species, but they're beloved by the population. So there's some contentious issue whether or not to, to eradicate them. I think they should be because they're not native to the area. And there are several studies being conducted whether, uh, as to their ecological impacts. So there are apparently some positive impacts and there's a lot of negative impacts, but it's positives and negatives. So this is actually hippos photographed in uh, um, Colombia, not in Africa, wild hippos. So hippos, there's a lot of incorrect myths. Hippos are not the most dangerous Africa, animal in Africa. Crocodiles, in terms of predation, are. Hippos kill a lot of people, but nowhere near the number of crocodiles, and obviously nowhere near the number of snakes, and nowhere near the number of mosquitoes. So they're not the most dangerous in Africa. That's a myth. They cannot hold their breath for hours, only for maybe five, six minutes at most. They don't sweat blood. I've explained this already. They don't put out fires. That's an old wives' tale. And they're not related to rhinos or elephants beyond being mammals. So... Let's talk lastly about a really fun little story from South Africa, fun and tragic. In 1928, a female hippo left St. Lucia Estuary and traveled south along the Natal coastline, now known as KwaZulu-Natal. She lingered several, for several months in the Mshlonga River mouth and then made her way down to Durban to the Amgeni River uh, and often went to hang out at the beachside at what is now known as the Durban Country Club. I mean, you can still, you know, it's still there, the Country Club, and she used to hang out there on the lawn, go down to the beach and go disappear back into the Amgeni River. Eventually, over time, it took her about three years, she made her way down to East London in the Eastern Cape. And despite being a protector species, there were a protect, protector species across Natal and across the Cape, she was shot by a pair of farmers for sport. They thought it was great fun to shoot a hippo. Uh, I don't have the names of the farmers, unfortunately, I couldn't find them. And they were arrested and both were fined $25, I mean, 25 pounds, which is a few thousand rand by today's money, but... Um, yeah, again, people killing animals for sports, uh, eradicating things that are beautiful. Um, but positive spin, she was actually made into a subject of a children's book in 1961. So that's everything we have to say about hippos. Um, we are running a bit shy of time, but we can maybe do a two minute Q&A. If you guys want to ask questions, you can put them on. Nick, Andre, just quickly um, on the question about the teeth, the canines and the incisors. Yeah. Um, you spoke about them being for self-defense purposes, but we as humans have not developed such big teeth. I think of other primates like chacmas who have them. I can understand a lion being a apex predator needing it. So is it, that's just my, 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 my thinking around the topic. Why did they particularly develop a tooth to defend themselves? Well, they need it from each other and from other animals coming in the water, predominantly against each other. They are highly competitive. And simply because they live in close proximity, there's a lot of conflict over females and over resources. Water is at a premium in Africa. And every generation, if, you all, if your teeth are 1% bigger than your neighbors, you will win the gene pool fight. And then your kids will have teeth that are 1% bigger. And gradually over time, you know, every generation, the, the individual that's got the biggest teeth wins the fight. And that's why these teeth have become bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's no necessi necessity for, for uh, hunting. It's purely just initially started with, and they will start biting each other with these small teeth. But if your teeth are slightly bigger than your neighbors, even if it's 1%, you'd win the fight. And then gradually over time, it would be, it would pervade through the gene pool. So it's not something that happens overnight. We've got about 30 seconds uh, left, guys. We can save this for the Q&A on Saturday, and we can go full depth into hippos if you guys want. I'm glad this lesson went longer than I thought. But uh, thanks so much for joining. Um, I'll be posting this tonight on, on um, YouTube. Uh, if you've got any questions, you're welcome to ask me in the, the, the Nature Education group as well. If you're not on there, send me a WhatsApp message. Cheers, guys. Uh, good night. Auf Wiedersehen. Adios. I will see you soon. Uh, Q&A on Saturday. Cheers.